Welcome to Dopa Productions. Today we are going to talk about how do drugs pass through our cell membranes? Have you ever wondered how medicines reach their target? For example, how paracetamol goes from the guts and the digestive system to the brain passing through a lot of membranes and which are considered intact and impermeable to a lot of substances? Or how does oxygen pass from the air and the lungs into our bloodstream and then finally into the tissues and cells? One keyword can answer these questions. Transporters. Well, actually sometimes it doesn't require a transporter. To know how this happens, first, let's discuss the membranes. Cell membranes have two key characteristics. Semi-permeability, where only certain materials may freely cross. Large and charged substances are typically blocked. And the second one is selectivity, where membrane proteins regulate the passage of material that can't freely cross. These membrane proteins are called transporters. Thus, the passage of molecules and substances across a biological membrane may occur either passively or actively. Let's start now with passive transport. This type of transport is the most common mechanism of absorption for drugs. It is the passage of molecules from a high concentration location to a low concentration location, along the concentration gradient. This is just simply how nature works. And this happens so easily that it doesn't need the energy to do it. Thus, no ATP hydrolysis is required, and that's why it's called passive. Okay, so now we understand that no energy is needed, but how do molecules go from one side to another? The first one is by simple diffusion. Since the core of the cellular membrane is lipophilic, thus any lipophilic molecule, like ciprofloxacin, which is an antibiotic, will have no problem just diffusing through the membrane without any effort. The same happens with very small molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide. The second one is by osmosis. It is the passive transport of water molecules from the low concentration to the high concentration of solute and not solvent. This usually happens since the cellular membrane will not allow the solute to pass through it and thus water will always try to equalize the concentration of a solute across the membrane. Not to mention that water can pass easily through the membrane. The third one is by facilitated diffusion, which is also a kind of passive transport. As we know, small charged molecules like ions and large molecules like sucrose will not be able to pass easily like the lipophilic or very small molecules. They will need some help, but not energy. They just need a tunnel to pass through. So who provides this tunnel services? I think you guessed it right. The membrane proteins, where they will help these molecules to pass through the lipophilic cellular membranes. Examples, ions will be able to pass through their ion channels like sodium, potassium, and calcium, and large molecules will have their carrier proteins like glucose. The fourth method is paracellular transport. Water-soluble compounds can use this transport method like glucose and amino acids. The second type of transport is by active transport. When you jump into the pool, you don't need energy to go down, only gravity is needed. But if you want it to go up, you need energy to go up again to the jumping point. Now let's downscale this example into molecules. Cells use different energy sources to allow this active transport through their membranes. The first one is by primary or direct active transport. It involves the hydrolysis of ATP to provide energy, like the sodium-potassium ATPase. But how does it happen? First, three sodium ions, which are considered here the green squares, will bind to their location in the pump from the inside. Then, ATP hydrolysis to ADP occurs and the pump is now phosphorylated. After that, once the pump is phosphorylated, it will undergo a conformational change and will open on the other side, releasing the sodium ions outside of the cell. The fourth step is that two potassium ions, which are here the purple squares, will sit in their location and dephosphorylation will occur. The dephosphorylated pump will undergo a conformational change and will open on the other side of the membrane and thus releasing the two potassium ions inside of the cell. The second type of active transport is the secondary or indirect active transport. You know that we can gain energy from the waterfall, right? The energy that the falling water creates can be converted to electricity that we can use. That's how secondary active transport works. A molecule that is moving from its high concentration to the low concentration will not require energy. However, the energy that it creates with this movement will be utilized to move another molecule from its low concentration to its high concentration side. The third type of active transport is endocytosis. 
When the molecules are very large and they are lipid insoluble, such that they will not be able to pass through the membrane or any channel that facilitates the passage, they will bind to a specific receptor on the cell membrane. This binding will trigger the formation of a pocket in the cell membrane and eventually pinching down and the formation of an intracellular vesicle that contains the molecule. The last method of active transport is pinocytosis. It literally means cell drinking. The difference between pinocytosis and endocytosis is that endocytosis requires binding to a receptor to trigger the process. Pinocytosis is the process of ingestion of extracellular fluids where molecules close to the membrane will be ingested too. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe to my channel.